All right, Dr. Jones, I think we're all set. If you just let us know when to change sides, we'll be happy to do that. Oh, okay, okay, great. Sorry for the technology issues here. Uh, technology is wonderful when it works and when the person that's using it knows how to work it. So uh, sorry for the delay, but I'm Althea Taylor-Jones with AARP, a volunteer. I've been volunteering, I guess, for about uh, 20 years with AARP. And unfortunately, the last two years of being uh, sort of held hostage with Zoom. And I've got to the point now, and I'm sure many others are as well, are Zoomed out. So um, our workshop this morning, we're looking at living longer, living smarter, and just want to live in, as independent as possible as long as we can in our communities, in our homes, um, make our home a home for life. And with some actionable low cost um, or free steps to help navigate housing, health, finances, and more. And now you can have peace of mind as you consider your tomorrow, whether you're beginning or continuing a plan, uh, this uh, will help you hopefully. Hopefully you receive the worksheets, the assessment worksheet that I uh, sent. And if you have that worksheet, uh, just follow along with us as we go. There are three processes here. We need to decide which options can help keep us in our homes for life and also create a plan that reflects our interests as well as our resources that we have available to us and then share those decisions with others so that they will know your preferences as well. And you may also want to share the planning process with friends and family so they too can plan their futures as well. So as you complete the worksheet, consider the day-to-day -day help that you might need if you experience some limitations or some chronic conditions. So it's time to take control and put your best foot forward. And we'll move on to the next slide. What is long-term care? Uh, many of us have experienced long-term care with family members, with friends, or whomever, and we know that long-term care basically is just day-to-day -day help that people will possibly need as they uh, in, deal with illnesses, as they deal with uh, disabilities, perhaps, or other conditions that uh, last for a long term, so to speak. And some people may need long-term care longer than others, some for several months, maybe for years, and others will need long-term care for a lifetime. Next slide. Next slide, please. Health, this is an overview of the health issues. As I told you, there are four sections to this. And the first one is your health. Then we'll look at your home and community. And we'll also take a look at your finances. And of course, the fourth one is your wishes or your last wishes. When we're looking at the health, look at our family history, what diseases or what illnesses uh, tend to run in our families, what screenings and immunizations that we have completed and which ones do we still need to complete. And then of course, managing our medications. Most Americans are, particularly those 65 and older, are taking five or more medications on a daily basis. And there is a need to manage those medications, making positive health choices about what we eat, how we eat, and uh, how we exercise, how we move, how we keep that movement going throughout our lifetime. Also looking at our brain health, how are we engaging uh, with our brain and some new healthcare technology and tools. If we're doing um, our healthcare over the computer virtually, or if we're going in to see our healthcare providers and so forth and so on. Smartphones are now one of the main uh, tools that we use for many things, including uh, examinations from our healthcare providers. Next slide, please. Some common screenings that are, are very necessary for us, uh, blood pressure screenings on a regular basis, cholesterol screening, colorectal, depression, diabetes, prostate, and so forth and so on. We know that uh, these chronic diseases can wreak havoc as we get older, depending on what our stamina is, depending on what our immune system is, is doing for us or against us. We need to make sure that we're getting all of these screenings on a regular basis and that we're following up with our healthcare providers. Next slide, please. Additional screenings are particularly for women uh, to remain healthy and active. Women should get a mammogram on a regular basis, the pap smear tests that are recommended, and the osteoporosis screening. Uh, these are screenings that many tend to overlook, and if there is no um, negative connotation or there's no negative feeling regarding that, they tend to avoid getting those. But these are very critical, particularly for women as we age. Next slide, please. 
Immunizations, doctors recommend certain immunizations for adults. Do you get your flu shot on a regular basis? Do you get your pneumonia shot as is recommended? Uh, talk to your physician, talk to your healthcare provider about whether you need a tetanus shot. Those are recommended every 10 years, uh, whether you've gotten your hepatitis immunizations, uh, measles, shingles, and if you have experience shingles that can be a horrible experience for many people so make sure that you're getting your shingles vaccines um, as recommended chicken pox or other shots and boosters that are recommended by healthcare providers there's a list of, of various uh, immunizations that are recommended and look at the age categories as well as look at health conditions and other diseases or, or conditions that you're dealing with particularly when you look at your family history and see what are the main diseases that um, as they say run in your family or that are hereditary so to speak that have been passed on from generation to generation and possibly could uh, cause some negative issues for us as we age. Next slide, please. Sharing your personal medication record. If you go online to the AARP website, you can find this medication uh, record. You can uh, copy that and, and make sure that you're listing your medications. It asks for what you're taking, how long you've been taking, who prescribed it, why is it prescribed, the dosage, and so forth and so on. And that's always helpful to have, and particularly to have a copy in your wallet or in your glove compartment of your car if you're still transporting yourself on a regular basis. What would happen if you had an accident or if you passed out and someone needed to know if there are any medications that you're taking that you would need to, to get? immediately or if that's something that they would need to contact your doctor for. The information regarding your physician should be in there as well with the phone numbers and so forth and so on. So adults, uh, as I said earlier, age 65 tend to take an average of five or more medications, prescription medications. And then when you add the over-the-counter drugs to that, that can make it um, even more critical that you have a record of all the medications that you're taking. Give your doctor a copy, give your pharmacist a copy and a friend or a family member. And as I said earlier, keep a copy in your glove compartment or somewhere handy in your wallet. Make sure that it's there in case um, you would need that. Sometimes I think what happens with a, a lot of people who are diagnosed with diabetes, they tend not to wear that bracelet that tells a person if you pass out, if you're type one, if you're type two, if you're on insulin, insulin dependent or non-insulin dependent. So carry a copy with you and keep all that information with you. Um, there was a time when it was recommended that you put a copy on your refrigerator at home. I know a lot of the refrigerators now, uh, they're not metal, so to speak, and it won't stick to the refrigerator, but you can at least put a copy on the cabinet door or somewhere nearby, just in case there is a family member that would need to know what's going on. There are situations where they have now a jar or a vial that you put in the refrigerator. You can put a copy of your medication record in that, such that it's available as well to someone that would need that to assist you in case of an emergency. Next slide, please. Making positive healthcare choices. I've talked a bit about um, eating appropriately. Recommendations from the Department of Health and Human Services uh, tells us not to smoke. If we're smoking, quit smoking. Be physically active. Moving. Movement is very important. Not necessarily that you're running a marathon, but that you're at least moving. Walking around the house, walking around the porch, walking around the street, wherever you can go to be physically active. Eating a healthy diet, making sure that we're getting the appropriate amount of fruits and vegetables, uh, controlling our weight, uh, drinking alcohol in moderation if we drink at all. And if we look at the plate that's on the screen, you can see that there are more fruits and there are more vegetables basically than any other portion of that plate. Uh, grains as well is, is a large portion. And make sure that we're getting enough protein and dairies and that we're mixing those in the appropriate amount that we need to mix so that we're getting a healthy diet. Next slide, please. Still looking at the health choices, brain health is, is another separate workshop that AERP offers, and that's perhaps one that could be recommended or that could be requested, I should say, from uh, AARP. It, it goes in depth 
about brain health, but there are five activities to improve your brain health. Movement, as I said earlier, exercise, discover, thinking, working crossword puzzles, doing other activities so that we're engaging our brain, reading, doing those types of activities, relaxing, of course, it's very important, making sure that we're getting the proper amount of rest and relaxation. Then, of course, the nourishment, as I've talked earlier regarding the types of foods that we're eating and, and how often we're eating those, as well as connecting staying connected with friends, family, with neighbors. Uh, the pandemic has been really, has wreaked havoc, as I said earlier, on a lot of people and they're isolated, socially isolated, as well as feeling that they're being held hostage, can't get out and do the types of things that they once did, cannot connect with neighbors or friends or other individuals. And that tends to wreak havoc on our brain as, as well as the rest of our body. Next slide, please. Home and Community Overview will explore how to assess your home comfort and safety. And that's another workshop, as I said earlier. There's so many workshops that AARP offers. The Home Fit Workshop is one I believe that Bob Birkin will be doing that one for you. And he will go into how you can change the home that you're living in to make it a home for life, giving you some tips and some, some ways that you can make that more comfortable, make it safer for you as you live in your own home, discussing some housing options, perhaps moving in to a assisted living or moving into a retirement facility and so forth and determine what community features are most important to you, whether you need a grocery store, whether you need a pharmacy, whether you have a sidewalk in your area, so forth and so on, and then explore the community services that are available to you, such as transportation or some ways that you can get to your health care provider. If the health care provider is in your community or near you, particularly for those persons who are no longer driving or need to at least um, limit their driving, that could be a possibility for you as well. Next slide, please. Aging in place, that's in, in, in the home and community as well. When we look at the U.S. Uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, they define aging in place as basically the ability to live in your own home live in your own community and live there safely and independently and comfortably, regardless of your age, not just for us that are 65 and older, but for all age categories, all in cat income categories, real, as well as your, your ability level, whether you're disabled, whether you're totally able to move around, whether you have some limitations and so forth and so on. So it doesn't matter for every age, for every category. Next slide, please. There's the home fit guide that I mentioned earlier. And that's, as I said, just a totally separate workshop. But when we're talking about this particular workshop, Living Longer, Living Smarter, it basically gives you just a, a little tidbit of all of the workshops that we offer so that you will know exactly what you need to do and how to combine all of those different activities to live as safely as possible for as long as possible in your own home. Um, with this particular one, as I said, um, Bob will go into details about that. Uh, he's a certified aging in place specialist and he will talk with you more about the recommendations to help make home modifications and also some solutions to, to common barriers. Say for instance, a step-free entrance or installing a chairlift and so forth and so on. Next slide, please. What technologies can help? Um, as I said earlier, I mentioned about smartphones and tablets and computers and all the technology that's available. If we have access to the technology, using it appropriately, taking some, perhaps taking some courses on that, that's another um, workshop that can be offered in terms of the technologies that can be helpful. Look at our smartphones, monitoring the apps on the phones, the voice activated medical alert system, uh, sensor and tracking devices. Uh, there's a commercial that you possibly see on TV where uh, it says I've fallen and I can't get up. Well, those are some of the, the situations that we will find ourselves in, particularly if we are losing our balance, if we're losing uh, connections in terms of being able to, to walk safely in our home or if our our medical situation is such that it's causing us to lose touch, um, lose our balance, falling, those kinds of um, things that can happen to us. So with that voice activated medical alert system where you can get in touch with someone if you fall, if you have a situation where you need medical attention immediately, if that's connected through your security system and through your, your um, EMS and, and other areas that are in your other services, I should say, that are in your area and those sensors and tracking devices 
places can help us to, to remain as safe as possible for as long as possible. So think in terms of those devices. If you do not have one and if you need one, talk with your medical provider and see what can um, happen to get you in a safer situation. Next slide, please. Community resources and services. Um, when we talk about community, we're talking about more than people living in the same geographical area. We're talking about your exercise and wellness program. Can you get to the Y? Can you get to an exercise a gym or some place where you can exercise on a regular basis? Can you get to a park? Is there a park available in your area? Uh, a transporta transportation, as I said earlier, is there a bus system or is there an Uber or other cab type system where we can uh, secure transportation if we need it to get to the places we need to go, like the grocery store, the pharmacist, to the, the gym or wherever we're going. Are there homemaker and chore services available? Are there some that we can get in touch with that we can rely on that we know will provide the services that we need? Meal delivery, meals on wheels, other types of things, um, congregate meal sites. Is there a community center or is there a senior center where you can go and you can get your meals if you need them? Do you need meals delivered to your door? And if so, are you connected with the appropriate resources to be able to get those? Home care services or adult daycare. Uh, if you need someone to come in to assist you a couple hours a day or two or three days a week uh, for a half day or what have you, are you connecting with those services? Do you know who they are? Are you connecting with the area agency on aging? Are you connecting with senior services and some of the other work organizations that can help you to make the contact and get the types of services that you need to assist you. Next slide, please. Should you move? That's another question. Um, are you in a two-story home? Do you need to move into a one-level home? We lived in a, a tri-level home for probably 30 years, I would say, when our children were younger and we needed the space and, and needed to make sure that they had their space, we had our space and there was enough space for us all. And then of course, when the girls grew up and left home on their own, then we moved into a one level home. There is no step in our home right now. Uh, I wasn't particularly that um, savvy about living on a slab, a concrete slab. However, there is no step. You can come in in the garage, into the kitchen without a step. Even if I needed to use a wheelchair, if I needed to use crutches or cane or what have you, a walker, I could do that. Navigating the front porch, coming up from the sidewalk, there is no step. The only um, heightened area there is, is just the, the, the width of a brick, just to get up from the sidewalk up on the brick front porch. So those are some things that you need to consider. Even if you cannot um, move into a situation where it's on one level, then you possibly can get a chairlift or you could possibly install some other type of lift that you could get from one level to the other, or you could rearrange your home and move the main bedroom on the, on, on the bottom level. And as I said, Bob will talk to you more about that when he does the home fit workshop. So look out for that one as well. Next slide, please. Deciding where to live. Some people grow tired of the effort and the expense of, that's required to keep up a home. Maybe you want to downsize. If you have a larger home, maybe you want to get rid of that home. Sell that home and move into one, one less bedroom or one less area to maintain. Others prefer the services that come with different types of housing, like assisted living or retirement communities, if you can afford to move into those. Many enjoy the activities offered by organized communities. I know you probably watch on TV, The Golden Girls, and you see how those, those women live together in one home and how they support each other and share the space. That is, um, I think, a very valuable concept if you can uh, manage to get involved with something of that nature and if you're interested in it, sharing the home, sharing the responsibilities, looking out for each other. It's almost like a small retirement home of sorts, a family care home. Next slide, please. These are choices, a lot of the ones that I've already mentioned, uh, retirement facilities or communities, so to speak, senior apartments, the villages and assisted living, uh, so forth, government housing, you can move in with your family if that's possible, home sharing arrangements, as I said, with the Golden Girls, and looking at the 55 plus communities, apartments and condos and so forth and so on, as well as if you're at the point where uh, total assistance is needed, uh, total care is needed, then possibly moving into a nursing home or the rehab facility uh, for the rest of your life. Next slide, please.
Next slide. Here we are with the finances. Boy, oh boy, this is, is perhaps the, the most important section that we need to really concentrate on. Because in this section, we're gonna explore the cost of long-term care, government and community-based programs, as well as private financing strategies and working with a financial professional for the long-term care. And of course, some long-term care insurance options. And move on to the next slide, please. Answer these questions for me. Think, just think to yourself. Do you think a year of in-state college tuition fees, room and board costs more or less than one year of a nursing home? Just, just think about that to yourself. And of course it costs more to live in a nursing home. It's over $100,000 per year in some nursing homes for a private room. And the cost is continuing to rise. The second question, Say to yourself, I feel prepared or unprepared for my future care needs. Do you have all your plans in place? Do you have all your papers in place? Do you have the finances that will, that will support the plans that you have in place? How are you going to live for the rest of your life? How are you going to have the quality of life that you think you should have for the rest of your life? Next slide, please. Look at the cost of long-term care. Can you afford long-term care? Medicare was never designed to cover long-term care. And so understanding Medicare, there is a website that you can go to, the www.medicare.gov. Lots of information on that website. If you have questions regarding Medicare, please feel free to tap into that website and, and find the information, find the answers to the questions that you perhaps would have regarding Medicare. Next slide, please. Medicare home health care. Medicare will pay for some home care only if there are conditions, only if the doctor orders the home health care, only if it is skilled care from a nurse or a therapist, only if the person is homebound and only the care is part-time or intermittent and services are from a Medicare certified agency. These are the conditions that we must meet if we are to receive or expect to receive Medicare home health care. Next slide, please. Medicare skilled nursing care. Medicare covers up to 100 days, but only if. And remember those only ifs. If it's in a skilled nursing or rehab facility and it's ordered by a physician, and only if you're hospitalized with a related condition first for three plus days, you probably hear of the three midnights. That's what you're talking about, the three full days in the hospital before you would receive any Medicare assistance for that type of service. Care is provided at a Medicare certified facility. The facility must be Medicare certified. And then look at the last one there. Medicare pays 100% for days, what? One through 20. Then you pay co-pays for days 21 through 100. And then after 100 days, who pay? You pay all the costs. Next slide, please. Medicaid, that helps people with low income and assets uh, to pay for their medical and their long-term care, but you must meet their financial category for that. Medicaid expansion is critical for this segment of the population. Uh, working with the General Assembly through the Senior Tar Heel Legislature, I've been with them now for since 2006 as the um, delegate for Forsyth County representing all seniors in the county and it's sometimes it's, it's really a, a hard job trying to get the politicians to understand what the needs are for our seniors and we have been fighting for Medicaid expansion for quite some time now and, and, and we're sort of easing into a little more assistance but not quite as much as some of our seniors would actually need to live the quality of life that they deserve to live. Next slide, please. Other programs that are possibly available, national and community-based organizations offer some resources, some government programs are there, some disease prevention programs, and some faith-based groups uh, through um, church or other institutions that have some funding where they assist older adults and other adults as well, not just older adults, but every age group. Next slide, please. Where can you find help? How many of you have actually made contact with the area agency on aging? 
When we talk about the area agency on aging, we're talking about um, human services uh, through the division of health and human services through the state, as well as the division of aging and adult services. And we can find assistance, particularly for our elders through the area agency on aging, although they sponsor other programs as well. There are some websites that are very critical. If you need to find some additional information, www.eldercare.gov. Lots of good information on that website. And of course, the phone number. Uh, I would uh, suggest that you, you jot that down just in case you need to get in touch with someone. Uh, also looking at the www.ptrc.org. That is from our area agency on aging in, in region G across the state covering 12 counties. Um, some, your county is involved with that. We, we cover Forsyth, Guilford, Davie, Davidson, Alamance. Uh, we cover, uh, sorry, we cover Stokes. We cover, um, I believe those are basically, maybe I didn't name all 12 of them, but those are the ones that are in our area for the 12 counties that we cover, uh, Montgomery and, and Randolph. Those are the others that I did not mention. But those are covered through the, through the Area Agency on Aging in Region G. But there are 16 area agencies on aging throughout the state of North Carolina. So every, every county is covered through an area agency on aging. Most communities have services that come to your home or are in a central community location. You can either go to the Area Agency on Aging office or you can go to a senior center or several senior centers that are sponsored through the Area Agency on Aging. Next slide, please. How can you pay for long-term care? Uh, here again, when we talk about finances, when we're talking about living the best life that we possibly can live during our golden years, so to speak, we look at several opportunities or several options if we have those available. Looking at our retirement income, looking at our savings, investments, life insurance, reverse mortgages, and long-term care insurance. And of course, if you if you bought or purchased long-term care insurance some years ago, possibly that's, um, you're okay with that now. Uh, I believe it was 20 plus years ago that we purchased our long-term care insurance. But now if you're trying to purchase long-term care, it's really expensive. Those costs have, have just gone through the roof and many people can't even afford to consider purchasing long-term care insurance policies because of the costs involved. So if you have not planned and if you're at the point where you need to start planning towards your future for your golden years, look at these types of, of possible ways to pay for your long-term care. Next slide, please. Here again, long-term care insurance will cover some of the cost of long-term care, but not necessarily all of the cost of long-term care. There are different types of policies. Some will pay for 80%, some will pay for 90%, some will pay for, um, if you have an elimination period, you pay for the first three months and then they will pay a certain amount after that. Some of them will pay for in the institution or in the facility type of care. Some will pay for home care where you can actually receive the same services at home that you would receive in a facility and those will be covered at a percentage. So look at, if you have a long-term care insurance policy, make sure you go back and you look at what the what you can get from that policy. In other words, what are the services that are covered for you so that you're prepared just in case you need to tap into that long-term care insurance policy. Next slide, please. Financial professionals, consider consulting if you have not already. A financial professional about planning for long-term care. Financial planners, investment advisors, insurance agents, estate planning attorneys, there are lots of financial people out there. Get a referral from someone that you trust and make sure that you're doing your homework if you need to invest in this further. Next slide, please. Finding a financial professional, as I said earlier, get a referral. Make sure that you're requesting at least interviews with at least three professionals. You're not just taking just the first one that you find, but you're doing a comparative analysis to find out, hopefully, which one is the best option for you. Ask for references and call those references. Follow up on those individuals. Make sure that you're getting the types type of information that you need on them. Verify their credentials. There are a lot of frauds. There are a lot of fake people out there. There are some that's 
basically just looking for your money so that they can rip you off, so to speak. So be very careful with that. Uh, consult with Area Agency on Aging. Consult with the Attorney General's Office if necessary. Consult with the Division of Aging and Adult Services or Health, Health and Human Services down in, in Raleigh. Our state offices are there to protect us. Make sure you use them. Also use the Secretary of State's Office. Um, they're there to assist us with a lot of the things that we need, particularly when we talk about the last wishes and the end of life type of documents that all of us should have in place. So verify the credentials, as I said, and understand how that person get, gets paid so that you can feel comfortable with contracting to get that service from them. Next slide, please. Your wishes. This is the fourth area that we're talking about. In this section, we'll explore what is an advanced directive, where to locate your advanced directive forms, completing your own advanced directive, sharing your advanced directive, and questions. Have I created my personal advanced directive? Ask yourself that question. You don't have to answer it out loud to your neighbor or whomever, but you need to ask that question of yourself. And if you have not created that, then what are your wishes? How do you want to live at the end of your life? Do you feel prepared for your future? Have you put things in place such that someone else could, could pick up the pieces when they need to pick up the pieces? Next slide, please. What is an advanced directive? As you can see, an advanced directive is a legal way to tell your loved one and your doctor the types of care that you want. If you're unable to make those medical decisions for yourself, they're there, they're in writing, they have been notarized, they have, they're official, someone else can pick up the pieces, they can take that document, and they can do what, our, what we ask them to do, if we cannot do that for ourselves. Make sure you, you copy this website, that's the Secretary of State of North Carolina, www.sosnc.gov. They are very helpful. If you have not have not housed your document there with them, you have not completed your document and housed it there with them, I believe the fee is $10 for each document. You can house your document there with the Secretary of State's office. That way you can tap into that document wherever you are, whether you're in the country, out of the country, wherever you are, as long as you have access to technology, you can actually tap into your document to ask any questions or contact them to make any changes or what have you. Next slide, please. Your living will and your healthcare power of attorney. A living will basically tells the medical professionals and your family which medical treatments you want and which ones you receive or, or you refuse, and under what conditions you will receive those or you will refuse those. Many persons at the end of life choose to not receive certain medications or certain other treatments. They just say, just, just let, me, let me go naturally, so to speak. They choose not to go on life support. They choose other options. A healthcare power of attorney allows you to appoint someone to make your healthcare decisions for you anytime that you're unable to make them for yourself. And that's key. If you're at the end of life and you cannot make your decisions and you have no one to make those decisions for you, that can really create a problem. It can create a problem not only for the rest of your life in terms of the types of treatments that you choose to or choose not to receive, but in terms of what happens after you have gone. So make sure that you're, you're getting in touch with um, the professionals that you need to get in touch with and putting these documents in place. Next slide, please. There are six steps to creating an advanced directive. Remember, you have to start the conversation. Then you select the healthcare agent, the person that you trust, and the person that you would put in place to take care of your, make those decisions for you and take care of you. Complete your advanced directive. Make sure that that uh, document is completed. Then you review it with an attorney to make sure that it's legal and everything is in place. Store that document in a safe place. Don't put it in your safety deposit box at the bank. You can put a copy in there, but make sure the original is downtown at the clerk's office and or you have it listed with the Secretary of State's office in Raleigh where you can access it electronically and then share your wishes. Share your wishes with those persons or that individual with whom you've chosen to make those decisions for you at the end of life. It's, um, it's, it's, it's very, very... Uh, 
concerning to think of someone who is at the end of life and, and there is no one that can assist them with making those types of decisions that need to be made. Uh, unfortunately, many times older adults find themselves in that situation, particularly when they have family that are at a geographic distance away, or there is distance in terms of the relationship with family members where no one is in charge or no one chose to, to be in charge or you didn't want someone to be in charge where the relationships are negative and, and not positive enough to, to have someone in the family in charge, then perhaps you choose someone outside of the family. That's your choice at the end of life, to choose the person that you trust, the person that you want to make those final decisions for you. Many times we tend to forget that there are friends, there are other individuals, there are agencies, there are organizations that will work with us to make sure that that happens. Next slide, please. What is your attitude toward death? That person needs to know your attitude toward death. What gives your life meaning? They need to know that as well. What are your spiritual and religious beliefs? That should be known. What are your wants and your desire, desires if you're incapacitated? If you're incapacitated, what do you want to happen to you? What do you choose not to happen to you? Your preferences. Do you want to die at home? Or would you rather expire in an institution or, or, or some other location? That's key. It must be known to that individual in charge of making those decisions. Next slide, please. Select your healthcare agent. Pick someone, as I said earlier, you have to pick someone that you'll trust that will be there for you now and in the future that will not abandon you. Can you talk with your healthcare professionals? You need to talk with them, make sure that they know what's going on. Can, can that person need to be able to talk with them as well? They need to be able to talk about end of life care. Uh, that person must follow your wishes, be willing to follow your wishes. Um, not that uh, a situation that I've experienced uh, more than once where the person said, well, my mom would have wanted such and such. This is not what mom would have wanted. She would have wanted this. She told me this. But if you're not um, in agreement with what mom wanted, that could create some, some difficult situations. And it does, unfortunately, within families. They could need to follow your wishes. Meet your stage criteria. Um, I was in a situation where I was providing care for a sister in Tennessee. Tennessee's laws are different than North Carolina. So I had to study the Tennessee laws to make sure that those, those documents that I was assisting my sister with were meeting the standards according to the state of Tennessee and not the state of North Carolina. So if we're in charge of assisting someone or we're the agent assisting someone with making those end of life decisions, we need to know the state criteria, the state laws. Review those documents with an attorney uh, such that we are doing them appropriately, making the appropriate decision. Next slide, please. Share those wishes. This is what we talked about. You create your document when you, and then you decide and after you decide what it is that you need, you create the document. And then, of course, the third step, as I said earlier, is to share those documents. You discuss your wishes with your loved one. Let your family members know in writing who is your health care agent and why you chose that individual. Review documents with everyone concerned. And then you discuss your advanced directive with your physician or other health care providers, particularly when you have more than one member in the family that perhaps is interested in assisting with those end of life types of wishes. Say, for instance, if you have two children, if you choose one and not the other, then the second child, the one that you did not choose, need to know why you chose the one that you did choose. And it should be obvious, but many times it's not obvious. So you need to be very, very, very genuine, very gentle with that in making sure that every individual is understanding why those decisions were made. And perhaps they need to know that they were made on your behalf, not necessarily for them in their situation, but in many cases, it could be for them in their situation. One would perhaps have more knowledge, one would perhaps have more time, one would perhaps be closer in terms of distance or on, on, on being able to get to you if you needed them. These are situations or, or conditions that you should consider when you're choosing that healthcare proxy. Next slide, please. Other important documents, as I said earlier, your will, your financial power of attorney, and the letter of instructions. Uh, 
My husband pastored for 35 years, and working with the parishioners in the congregation uh, was really a very rewarding situation. However, there were many situations where um, perhaps some of the family members questioned what decisions their, their loved ones had made or why they did not choose them, why they decided that they wanted this particular hymn for the funeral, why they wanted this particular um, scripture for the funeral, so forth and so on. So your letter of instruction includes your funeral plans. Where do you, where do you want your body laid for the last time before, before you're gone? For good, so to speak. What funeral plans? What funeral home? What what financial affairs do you need to put in place? Your personal items and your messages. As I said earlier, what hymn? What uh, what scripture? Oh, who would you like to do your eulogy? Perhaps not the person that is obvious, but those are the types of things that would be included in that letter of instruction. And hopefully, your proxy will listen to or they will follow that letter of instruction. These are key things, personal items and messages. Okay, mom, who do you want to have your jewelry? Who do you want to, to, to give the piano to? Who do you want to have your fur coat? Who do you want to have uh, your computer? Who, who do you want to have your big screen TV? Who do you want to have uh, your chair lift, so forth and so on? Who do you want to leave your automobile to if dad's not there and you want, can't leave it to him? Keep those documents that documents in a safe place and accessible. Make sure that the proxy has a copy of that document. They know what they need to do. They know what their responsibilities are because they have it in writing. You've discussed it with them. You've gone in detail with them so that they know exactly what's expected. And then tell your loved one where to find those documents in case of an emergency. Next slide, please. Review those documents. If there's been a divorce or there's been a remarriage or there's been a marriage in the family, things change. If the diagnosis has changed, if the health has declined, those are types of changes that occur. And you need to look at revising the document because of those changes. If there's discord in the family, as I mentioned earlier, if the siblings are not um, compatible, if they're not getting along, so to speak, if relationships have declined, if they're at a distance and cannot meet the needs of the individual. If there's death of an agent, then you need to choose another agent. These are ideas or situations, I should say, that you need to review your documents and determine if they need to be changed, if they need to be updated, if, if something should happen from the originals. Next slide, please. Additional resources that you can con uh, get in touch with here again. This is an AARP workshop. You can go to the AARP Learn at 50 plus. They're uh, the AARP.org at caregiving. If you're looking for caregiving resources, there's a caregiving resource center. Uh, there are phone numbers there. If you, you're not on the computer where you can, if you're not, uh, I should say, uh, savvy with the computer or if you're not comfortable with the computer, you can always call those numbers. Um, look at the one with the www.ptrc.org. That is the Area Agency on Aging in our area, as I said, the 12 counties that I mentioned earlier. That is their phone number where you can actually call them if you uh, would prefer calling and talking to an individual. But prior to that, is if you're computer savvy, go on that website, look at all the services that are available. They even list the staff, all the staff names and numbers and email addresses and so forth and so on, where you can get in touch with them. You would perhaps even recognize some of the names there if you've lived in, in your area um, for quite a while because they've been there for years and years. Next slide, please. I, this is the last slide and just wanna thank you for investing in the planning of your future. And as I said earlier, this is your life that you're talking about. This is your future that we're talking about and making sure that you're putting in the effort and the energy to have those documents in place and to make sure that things are the way you would have them to be such that when you reach the end of your life, that you're happy with what you have chosen. Are there any questions, by the way? No questions? Okay. 
thank you very much. And um, if should you have any questions in the future, you can always get in touch with us. Um, information um, that was included in that presentation, those are contacts that you can make. And if you need to get in touch with me, you can certainly ask um, Jackie or Susan or one of the um, other individuals there how to get in touch with me or how to get in touch with Bob Gerken or Mark Hensley. We're in the triad community and cover Guilford County. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day and please stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much for your time. You're quite welcome. Have a good day, everyone.